Good evening, everyone from London. I'm Christiane Amanpour, and I'm very pleased to be able to honor this year's incredible awardees with you. We are really grateful that you can join us in this virtual celebration, sign of the times, of course. And 2020 has been a challenging year, of course. The sheer number of major stories that journalists have covered is daunting, from the anti-corruption protests known as SARS in Nigeria, to the racial reckoning in the United States and abroad all against the backdrop of the global COVID-19 pandemic. And looming over all of these has been the election in the United States. And let me just say that for journalists everywhere, and for the important matter of truth, this is indeed a significant inflection point because no longer will dictators, authoritarians, and other bad actors around the world be enabled and empowered by a US president denigrating the free press while also bleating about fake news. No longer will a wholesale assault on truth and facts be led by an American president. As my colleague at the FT pointed out, this has been the most successful project of political lying in modern history, in modern democracy, with a massive consequence that may even outlive the man himself. And my colleague goes on to ask this very fundamental and important question. Have journalists finally learned how to challenge political lies? It did take a while, if you remember in the past, for a few brave editors to drop the mic on the lies of Joe McCarthy. And we do need to ask ourselves whether we in the future will be brave enough to drop the mic, cut the cable, turn the lens away from even an American president who ignores the basic contract, the basic standards of evidence while hogging our platform. And since we're here, let us just take stock of and thank the Washington Post long labor of fact checking, calling out tens of thousands of false or misleading presidential claims over the last four years. Now, why do I say all this? Because it matters, especially to the people who we honor at this event. In the past four years, more than ever, journalists around the world have been routinely targeted online, and it's driving many to consider leaving the profession. Women journalists and journalists of color are often the first and the hardest hit in such moments of crisis. Now, supporting a news media that reflects a diversity of voices is a cornerstone of democracy, and it's at the heart of the IWMF's work. It provides support and opportunities to journalists around the world who risk it all to bring us the truth. And we're about to celebrate some of the women who embody this principle every single day. These extraordinary journalists are the recipients of the IWMF's Courage Award, the Gwen Ifill Award, and our groundbreaking leadership honoree. So it's my great pleasure now to introduce the executive director of the International Women's Media Foundation, Elisa Munoz. In her 16 years at the IWMF, Elisa has been at the forefront of efforts to support women journalists all over the world. And in the last five years alone, more than 1,000 stories from 49 countries have been published by upwards of 800 women journalists and women-led reporting teams. And all of this made possible with the IWMF support. In 2020, the IWMF provided more than $2 million in direct, that's $2 million, in direct support to more than 2,000, precisely 2,143 journalists in more than 234 countries. A lot of statistics, but they matter, each and every one of those people. Whether it's creating programs, supporting women-produced reporting, developing safety training for journalists, or providing emergency support to journalists in need, Elisa has been a champion for women in our business. Elisa. Thank you, Christian. We're honored to have you with us today. As a Courage and Journalism Award winner, you know firsthand what it means to question authority and to put yourself in the line of fire. And we're so grateful for your support. I'd like to start by thanking some of our sponsors. Bank of America, our national presenting sponsor, has been supporting our work for 14 years. Their commitment to women journalists through our mission is directly connected to our ability to make our work possible. We'd also like to acknowledge the incredible support from Bloomberg, CBS News, CNN, Facebook, and the Walt Disney Company. And thank you to all of your supporters for helping us to support women and women identifying journalists all around the world. 
A sincere thanks also goes to the Washington Post and the Washington Post Live team for making this transmission possible, especially Catherine O'Hearn and Chris Karate. Thank you. To our incredible dedicated staff and to our board of directors who are helping us to lead the urgent mission and the growth of this organization day in and day out, we are also thankful. 2020 has highlighted in so many challenging ways the absolute necessity to hear from journalists of all backgrounds, especially those like our awardees who are covering Russian-backed disinformation, repression in Egypt, the war in Syria, and the mistreatment of the Uyghur community in China. A free press, vibrant and responsible journalism has never been more vital. The work of our award winners exemplifies the finest elements of journalism in challenging circumstances. We need the perspectives of women, of people of color, of journalists from underrepresented communities representing what they see in their communities and in our world. And while the existential threat to journalism itself continues, it's our firm belief that you cannot save journalism if you don't save journalists. This year, the IWF created one of the largest pandemic response relief funds for individual journalists from Algeria to Zimbabwe. In addition, within a week of this summer's protest describing social injustice and police violence, with the support of Craig Newmark, the IWF created a U.S. emergency fund making $650,000 available to U.S.-based journalists of all genders to provide support for their immediate needs. And through the Black Journalist Therapy Relief Fund, we're providing financial assistance to black journalists who are unable to pay for the mental support they need during this time. We built a coalition to fight online harassment against women journalists and also brought our international hostile environments training to the US for the very first time. Take a look at this video to see who we are and to learn about the work that we're doing. Telling the truth is dangerous work and women journalists face unique threats. If we censor, silence, and attack women's voices, we'll never get the full story. The IWMF has been working to support women journalists for the last 30 years. We at the IWMF really believe in the need for a diversity of the news media, the principle that the news media should reflect the society on which it's reporting. Through a global pandemic, a racial reckoning in the US, and the election of a lifetime, women journalists have been on the front lines demonstrating day in and day out the true nature of essential work. In order to secure their work, in order to save journalism, we must save these journalists. In 2020 alone, when their work lapsed due to COVID-19, the IWMF has supported nearly 400 journalists from more than 65 countries with emergency grants. We supplied protective gear for those reporting on the front lines, offered hostile environment training for 700 journalists covering protests, and funded mental health support for black journalists enduring trauma while reporting on their communities. While much has changed over three decades, women are still underrepresented in the news, and we know our work is far from over. Our programs and resources have propelled thousands of women journalists' careers, supported the production of countless bylines, and helped them to stay safer on the job. We have so much more to do. Please join us. We cannot do this work without your financial support. Every dollar donated to the IWMF allows us to offer women and journalists additional resources to stay safe to stay in the industry and to bring you the news you need to maintain a free society and to keep you and your loved ones safe. Please consider giving right now by texting IWMF to the number 91999 and following the instructions texted to you, or you may donate by visiting IWMF.org. And now Christian will introduce you to our IWMF 2020 Courage and Journalism Award winners, our Gwen Eiffel awardee and our leadership honoree. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Elisa. This is the best bit, of course, because you meet the people who really count and who make the IWMF what it is. So first, 
We've all heard about Russian hackers attempting to influence voting in the United States. But what happens when that campaign is focused on you? Our first Courage in Journalism Award winner is the Finnish journalist, Jessica Aero, and she knows what happens when the trolls attack you. After years of reporting on Russian disinformation, hackers turned their sights on Jessica in a relentless attempt to discredit her work and inflict psychological pain. But Jessica continued her investigations, which led to the first action taken against pro-Kremlin disinformation efforts by a European country. Here's more of her story. Finnish journalist Jessica Aero had been publishing stories about online troll factories for two years before the Russian interference in 2016's U.S. election came to light. Jessica had exposed the scope of trolling and fake news coming from a Russian disinformation farm. My favorite thing is, of course, uh, for the journalists uh, to do investigative stories about all kinds of fake news sites and propaganda spreading. Jessica never paused to think what effect these stories would have on her life. After publishing her reports, Jessica herself became the target of merciless attacks by the Russian trolls. They concocted stories about her, shared her personal information online in order to discredit her words and incited death threats. The attacks only spurred her to do more. So I was planning to make one story about trolls, but this seems to be so serious topic that I will do many stories about it. Jessica fought back, and her case resulted in the first conviction of digital harassers in Europe. But she continues to be harassed, and she is still fighting. The prevalence of online harassment against women journalists has increased greatly over the past several years, and it's one of the issues that brought Jessica to the front of our list for winning the Courage Award. The widespread praise for her work and resulting digital smear campaign caught the eye of the U.S. government, and in 2019, Jessica was given an award from the State Department. Within weeks, suddenly and without explanation, it was revoked. An investigation revealed the cause was fear that Jessica's social media posts, critical of President Trump, would embarrass the State Department. Later that year, Jessica was the star witness in a Senate hearing about Russian disinformation. And pro-Russian comments on an industrial... While her own fight is not over, Jessica fearlessly continues to advocate against digital violence. I want to express my gratitude for the honor of receiving the IWMFS Courage in Journalism Award. Journalism for me offers the tools to serve and inform the audiences who are entitled to free flow of information. Messengers of the truth have always been attacked in order to stop them from spreading truth and facts which might be harmful to the powerful. But I will continue educating people about the Russian hostile influence operations as long as people want to hear me out. In addition, I would like to dedicate this award to the most courageous individuals who I know. The independent, critical Russian journalists who originally back in 2013 infiltrated and reported about the Russian troll factory in St. Petersburg. They, as well as other Russian independent journalists, are a true inspiration. Thank you. Congratulations, Jessica, and it's safe to say that the IWMF will not be rescinding this award. Keep up the fight, it helps us all. And now, to this year's Gwen Eiffel Award winner. Three years ago, the IWMF established the Gwen Eiffel Award in honor of the late Gwen Eiffel, of course, co-anchor of the PBS NewsHour. Gwen was a beacon for young journalists and for experienced colleagues. We watched as she broke barriers throughout her legendary career. And Gwen never forgot what it was like at the bottom. She remained a mentor and a role model for the rest of her life. And the IWMF honors Gwen's legacy with this award and the Gwen Eiffel Mentorship Program, which addresses the lack of women of color in leadership positions across newsrooms in the United States. 
This year's Gwen Ifill Award is Yamish Alcindor. We honor Yamish for her career of reporting excellence, starting at Newsday, then USA Today, then the New York Times, and now as the White House correspondent for the PBS NewsHour. But beyond those very real accomplishments, we also honor Yamish because she embodies the goals of mentorship and leadership that Gwen formed throughout her own career. We've all seen Yamish's steely resolve and grace under pressure at the White House. Yamish is incisive, her questioning and her insistence on getting the truth is a model for all reporters, of course. So, ladies and gentlemen, now, Yamish Alcindor. Thank you so much. Um, it's such an honor to be here with you and it's such an honor to get this award. Um, Gwen meant so much to me personally and, and professionally. Um, and to get this award in a year like this where so many journalists are doing so much work, um, where Jessica and so many others are facing harassment, real harassment in so many different ways, it just, it, it warms my heart and it, it tells me um, that this is an industry that is gonna be living and gonna be continuing to thrive along after this. So again, it's, it's such a treat to sit down with you personally because I've been watching you for so long. You along with Gwen are some of the biggest inspirations to me. So thank you so much. Well, Yamish, we're going to talk now for, for a few minutes. And I want to say, you know, kind of what I just said, you have been an inspiration. These four years have not been easy for any White House reporter. And you really put yourself there front and center. And you wouldn't sit down and you wouldn't take nasty and you wouldn't be told to be quiet. Just what is it actually like inside when you're having to deal with that from the world's most important elected leader on a daily basis? It can be a bit nerve wracking. Um, I think that this entire experience um, has has really, in some ways, given me a foundation um, and reminded me why I became a journalist. I became a journalist thinking about civil rights reporters and the the work that they had to do under under strenuous circumstances. At times, having to put their lives on the line. I'm um, in the 1960s, 1950s. I'm um, reporting on things like the death of Emmett Till, a young boy who was murdered in 1955, and so many other lynchings that we saw across the country. So, in some ways, um, while I think it was a little a little sh shaky at times to have the president of the United States call me nasty or yell at me and have all of his backers and his supporters come after me online. I also think it reminded me that I have this resolve in me that comes from watching people like you, Christian, but watching Gwen Eiffel, watching my own mother, who's a social worker, um, stand up to people and, and know what she was, what her purpose in life was. It reminded me that I come from a long line of women who have stood up for themselves. And there were so many times where the president wanted me to be quiet and I refused to. And I refused to because I know that the American people deserve a press um, that is pressing for information, pressing for truth, especially in a year like this where so many Americans um, were dying, so many Americans were looking to the news as a lifeline, understanding when, when we were gonna get testing done, when we we're gonna get a COVID vaccine. So many life and death issues were on the line this year, I mean, and have been on the line in years past, that it, it gave me in some ways this resolve to continue on in a way that I didn't think I had it in me in some ways, um, but it, 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 it was to me an experience that, that, that really confirmed for me um, the power of journalism and the power of women, frankly. Well, I think you've summed it up really well, the power of journalism, the power of women journalists. And, you know, you, you found in yourself the resolve uh, to carry on because I just love the way you say you view journalism, particularly through your lens of civil rights. I viewed it a little bit as human rights. It's a little the same um, with specific differences, obviously. But I just wonder, what in your childhood or in your journey up to where you are now prepared you for this? You know, I like to say, you know, you're doing what John Lewis, the great John Lewis said, make good trouble. Don't be silent. I think for me, um, being a black woman, being a woman of color, I've been told things about myself that I know not to be true. I've been told by editors that I didn't look confident enough. I've been told by people that you're not pretty enough to be on TV, that you're not skinny enough to be in front of a camera. I think I've, I've taken those things and they were life lessons that I was that I was learning um, how to believe in myself. I also think I watched my mom, who's a school social worker, she was a social worker for 35 years, go into people's homes and put herself aside and, and, and really think about the good of the country, the good of the family, the good of vulnerable populations. So I think those two things together um, 
prepared me for this year. And that is that I, one, had this real resolve. I think human rights is very much like civil rights. This real resolve to have a voice for people who may never make it into the White House, to, to be really passionate about getting their questions answered this year. But also, I had to remind myself that I had survived a career where people never thought I was going to get to where I am, which is being a White House correspondent for a national television news outlet. I had to remind myself that I had pulled myself up, that I had had this, this great support system of mentors, of family members who told me I was going to be okay and to keep pushing. And I think those two things put together um, got me through this year. And I don't know what it's like, um, you know, at, at PBS, I don't know whether you do the White House feed for a certain number of years, but if, I mean, I don't know, is it ending with this administration? Do you still want to keep doing that beat? Or what do you see as the next great beat for Yamish? For right now, I'm going to keep doing the White House beat. I've never covered another president, so I'm very excited to see what a traditional functioning White House looks like. Um, I'm not sure how long I'll be covering the White House. I didn't start my career thinking I was going to be a White House correspondent. I'm very much interested in race, in gender. A lot of the, my best moments in my career have been when I'm in people's living rooms talking to regularly everyday Americans about their life and how they're surviving. And a good, the good thing at PBS is that I can be a White House correspondent that still goes to Southeast Washington, D.C., or still goes to Mexico to talk about the president's immigration policy. But maybe at some point um, after the Biden administration or during the Biden administration, I might turn to something else. But right now, I think the White House, with all of the, the challenges ahead for the Biden administration, is a good place to be. Indeed. Well, good luck to you. Continued good luck. Congratulations on winning the Gwen Ifill Award, richly deserved. Yeah, Michelle Sindor, thank you so much. And thank now, you so much. A story about another brave journalist. The constant danger of reporting from war-torn Idlib in Syria doesn't silence our next Courage and Award-winning recipient, and she is Yakin Bido. Her daily broadcast from the region gave voice to some of those fighting the Assad regime. And for the last five years, Yakin has endured violent interrogations, arrests, and intimidation campaigns. And she pursued the stories of anti-regime fighters and the people trying to survive in her own city, all while showing her face to her viewers. It was a first for a woman in that region. And despite these challenges, Yakin isn't deterred. She says, quote, in journalism, I have a duty to carry a message which can transcend the borders of my country to the whole war world. So let's watch her story for a few minutes. هنالك حرب نفسية من قبل ميليشيات الأسد تشنها تلك الميليشيات مع الميليشيات الموالية لها سواء عن طريق من اخترت عمل الحالي لأني إنسان ويجب خدمة الإنسان ولتقديم فائدة لقضيتنا وثورتنا السورية. Yakin Bido reports daily from her hometown of Idlib, an area directly targeted by Syrian President Assad's war planes. The work is grueling, dangerous, relentless. She didn't plan on this life. Although trained as a sociologist, five years ago, Yakin picked up a video camera and started recording the events around her. She is now the only Syrian female journalist openly reporting her face uncovered, risking her life on the front lines. It is dangerous work, and she has received death threats. But as a woman, Yakin's challenges go beyond the conflict. أبرز الصعوبات والتحديات التي واجهتني خلال عملي كانت مجتمعية. منها نظرة المجتمع الدونية إلى عمل المرأة عامة والصحفية خاصة. Yakin is working in an environment that is inherently dangerous because of the armed conflict. But it's also dangerous because she's fighting a cultural norm as the face of the conflict for women. The Syrian civil war has raged for a decade. Half a million dead. Almost six million Syrians have fled their country. And another six million are internally displaced. The conflict seems to have no end. Despite the chilling fact that more than 138 journalists have been killed since the war began, Yakin continues her work, focusing on the humanitarian conflict and drawing the world's attention to the war crimes and human rights violations of the Russian-backed Syrian regime. أملي للصحافة ألا تبقى مقيدة ومحاربة كما حصل في بلدي سوريا. اسمي يقين بيدو من مدينة إدلب. 
مواليد 1993 ببداية الثورة السورية شاركت مع عائلتي بالمظاهرات السلمية مطلع عام 2012 اقتحم جيش نظام الأسد مدينة إدلب وأحرق منزل عائلتي فقط لأننا عائلة ثائرة بوجه الظلم طبعا تتالت الانتهاكات ضدنا من اعتقال من تهديد وطالت أقربائي وباتوا بينا مفقود وشهيد وأيضا فقدت أخي الصغير في الحملة العسكرية الأخيرة على شمال غرب سوريا عام 2015 بدأت بتغطية المأساة الإنسانية ووثقت مقتل المدنيين وشاركت قصص الأطفال والنساء وهذا طبعا لم يكن بالأمر السهل فقد واجهتني صعوبات عدة منها الأمنية ومنها المجتمعية وأيضا الاستهداف المباشر للأماكن التي نغطي بها وبسبب قيامي أنا وزميلاتي وزملائي بهذا العمل بتنا هدفا مباشرا لنظام الأسد وروسيا أواصل عملي في الصحافة لأن المرأة السورية يجب أن تضع بصمتها بالصحافة كونها أثبتت جدارتها في شتى مجالات العمل ولأنها غير قابلة لتقييد حريتها يتعرض الصحفيون في سوريا للموت بأي لحظة لهذا كان فوزي بهذه الجائزة هو تحد لإعلام نظام الأسد فمن جهة أثبتنا أن إعلام الثورة البديل تمكن من الوصول للمحافل الدولية وأوصل صوت الشعب السوري عامة والأحرار خاصة وأيضا هو دافع إيجابي لاستمرارية بعملي الذي لم يذهب هباء منسورة أهدي هذه الجائزة لأحرار سوريا ولأمهات المعتقلين وللشهداء وللنازحين والمهجرين قصرا في الخيام وأيضا لرموز الثورة الأوائل وللإعلاميين الذين ضحوا بأنفسهم ومهدوا الطريق حتى وصلنا ليومنا هذا والعمل بمهنية أكبر Incredible bravery, Yakin. I'm sure we all wish you Godspeed as you continue your dangerous and very important work. Now, it's an honor to present the IWMF's leadership honoree, a groundbreaking journalist and fierce advocate for truth, Susan Goldberg. Now, Susan is the first woman editor-in-chief of National Geographic since its founding in 1888, the first woman. Throughout her career, Susan's commitment to, in her own words, telling the story, telling it right, and telling it beautifully, left an indelible mark. The transformational effect of Susan's editorship at National Geographic has underscored the importance of promoting an inspired woman at the helm. And therefore, some of National Geographic's best work has come under Susan's leadership. The groundbreaking issues exploring the gender revolution, race, and women, a century of change, couldn't have come about without Susan's commitment to shine a light on uncomfortable truths, even about her own magazine. So let's hear more from the groundbreaking Susan Goldberg. As journalists, all of us know there are many ways to tell any given story. Since I work at National Geographic, let me tell you my story through visuals. This picture is a great example of the power of visual storytelling. Without a word, we understand the backstory here both that I'm the first woman at the helm of National Geographic and that this institution, like so many institutions, is changing before our eyes. I like this image so much it hangs in my office. Sometimes I view it with a sense of wonder. I can hardly believe my good fortune. Sometimes it makes me a little depressed. How could it have taken 126 years to find a woman for the job? And sometimes it just makes me laugh because as they say on Sesame Street, one of these things is not like the other. My story is simple and very lucky, as my career unfolded during massive changes in how we can tell stories and reach larger and more diverse audiences than ever, and at a time of growing opportunities for women. I was the intern they hired at the Seattle Post Intelligence or before I graduated college. That's where I started my reporting career, and I got to cover some amazing things. A few years later, I went to Detroit and became the first woman the Detroit Free Press sent to cover the governor and legislature in 1984. I went to San Jose as a young editor and was the city editor when the Loma Prieta earthquake happened in 1989. The staff of the San Jose Mercury News won the Pulitzer Prize for our coverage. Then I went to USA Today where I rose up through the ranks and met some interesting people along the way. Ten years later, I went back to San Jose as the first female managing editor, 
then the first female executive editor. Next, I became the first woman editor of The Plain Dealer in Cleveland, where we had all kinds of fun exposing the antics of corrupt county officials. I was the first female bureau chief of Bloomberg's Washington Bureau, where they obviously retouched photos. Then one day the phone rang. It was National Geographic. I became the editor-in-chief in 2014 and took on the additional role of editorial director the next year. I have loved all my jobs, but this one stands out for the range of work we can do about urgent issues around the globe, using every modern and traditional platform to reach hundreds of millions of people. We've been a finalist for the Pulitzer twice and have won nine national magazine awards, all credit to my inspirational, multi-talented colleagues. So that's my story. But one of the things I'm proudest of is how we're working hard to tell stories that can change perceptions of other people's lives, especially when we do stories about groups that are underrepresented or marginalized, like women and people of color. You can see this clearly through our photography. National Geographic has gone from running photos like this, the first time a woman was the subject of a picture in the magazine in 1896, and this, where women were depicted mostly as exotic objects or smiley props, to photos taken by women, showing women in real life, grieving, angry, working, caring, succeeding, and ultimately as the warriors we know women to be. 40 years have passed since I was the intern they hired. It's been my privilege and responsibility to tell other people's stories. Being a journalist is the honor of my life. Congratulations, Susan, and it only took 126 years. Thanks for joining us. Take it away. Journalists like Jessica Arrow exposing social media trolls in Russia or like Yakin Bido on Syria's front lines. I can't do what Golchera Hoya does to reveal the plight of the Uyghurs, and no one has imprisoned me like Salafa Magdi for doing a journalist's job. All I do is make choices about what stories we tell and who should tell them. And I say yes to things that scare me. You know, I was scared when we did an issue about race at National Geographic because I knew that to be credible, we needed to level with readers about the magazine's racist past, but we did that. And forthrightly owning that history was not just the right thing to do, it was the only way to move forward. And when we did an issue about evolving views on gender, I was scared to put a transgender girl on the cover, but we did. Some people canceled their subscriptions, yet to this day, countless others have told me that decision made a positive difference in their lives. And every day, I know it's imperative to keep pushing for our storytellers and expert sources to be as diverse as the world we cover. We are not there yet, but upending that dynamic at every news organization is as important as anything we do. If we want authentic stories, we need the perspectives of diverse journalists to tell them. We also need to keep shining our light both on women who can inspire us and never to forget the difficult, constrained lives of women and girls whose inequality can become invisibility until they can hardly be seen or heard at all. Changing that through our staffing and coverage is how we as journalists can help create a more equitable world. This I know. I also know that real change comes not just through big acts, but from a thousand smaller choices we make every day. And that's what I'll leave you with. It's a study in progress. It comes from doing the work, taking the risk, breaking the ground, passing the torch, and saying yes. Thank you so much for this great honor. Congratulations, Susan. Obviously, your long list of firsts are hugely inspirational and will pave the way for so many others. But I'm really struck also by what you, you know, the brave work you did of looking introspectively at your organization and fessing up and owning failures of the past. It's really inspirational that. Thank you. And now, on our next Courage in Journalism Award winner, she knows all too well the acute pain that comes with telling the truth. She is Gulchera Hoja, and she began her reporting career in Xinjiang, China. It's believed that the Chinese government has detained up to one million Uyghurs in this region. And so, as a Uyghur Muslim woman, it became difficult for Gulchera to continue to report the Communist Party line. 
when her only option to continue reporting in her native language was to join Radio Free Asia, she took the opportunity, but her employment in the United States resulted in China banning any chance of returning to her homeland. She just cannot get back there right now. And two dozen of her extended family members are now detained in the camps there. And yet, Gulchera knows that the only avenue to freedom is to tell their stories every day. Here's a little bit of her story. What kind of courage does it take to speak publicly against your repressive government, to talk about the egregious human rights abuses, about systematic discrimination, about press freedom, all while the authorities attack you by arresting, detaining, and even incarcerating your family? Gulchera Hoja knows the courage it takes. Gulchera had a successful career working for Xinjiang TV in China until on a trip to Europe, she heard newscasters from Radio Free Asia speaking the truth about the plight of her people, the Uyghurs. 11 million Uyghurs, a Muslim Turkic people, live in the northwestern Chinese region of Xinjiang. Chinese central government policies have curtailed the free expression of their religion. The government has imprisoned up to one million Uyghurs in so-called re-education camps. The pull of free speech led Gucera to leave her home and family and ultimately find strength through her loss. I feel I lost everything. You know, when, when, you, when you have that feeling, you become fearless. Today, she is a witness and chronicler of the horrors facing the Uyghur people, and her family has suffered for her freedom. My parents, my brother, and the 20 other uh, my close relatives, uh, cousins, aunts, all run up in one night. The kind of courage that Golchera displays is unique because she's fearing for those who she loves while she's speaking out not only for them, but for her entire community. Golchera continues to speak up for those who cannot. That's why I just doing my part to be voice of those voiceless people, the Uyghurs. This is my duty. Thank you so much for this extraordinary honor from the International Women's Media Foundation and the Courage in the Journalism Awards. I am incredibly grateful that my work has been recognized. I followed my passion of becoming a true journalist, and it led me to the United States, to our faith, and to my freedom. But I paid a dear price for my work. My family members have been arrested and detained, held without charges. My parents are taken hostage by the Chinese government, causing a painful separation in order to obtain my silence. Many still remain in the very camps and the detention centers that I and my colleagues first helped to expose in our investigations. It has been more than three years that we, as we were journalists at RFA, have been receiving no other news than the horrific description of the life of Uyghurs, full of pain, suffering, and deaths from the invisible war zone my homeland, where the 21st century surveillance state is secretly managing the concentration camps, prisons, and slave labor on an industrial scale. The meaning of this price from IWMF is enormous. It recognizes the actions of those of us who are reporting on rampant injustice, political repressions, and the erosion of human dignity. I want to cry out to my faithful listeners in that far distant land, telling them, never lose your hope. The world hears you. Thank you. It really is incredible, Gulshera reporting there, speaking out on behalf of her community and her family. But what a heavy price she's paying for telling the story of what are, in fact, the most serious violations of international humanitarian law. 
Our final Courage in Journalism Award winner is Solafa Magdi. She's covered politics, social unrest, human rights, and sexual harassment in Egyptian society. Her stories have run across a variety of global media platforms, but on November 26, 2019, police in plain clothes arrested Solafa and two others. A day later, state security prosecutors formally detained Solafa on charges of fake news and allegations of inciting terrorism. Solafa and the others have been kept in prison for just over a year with additional charges piling up on a monthly basis, and that's more than a year since she and her husband were separated from their seven-year-old son. With no contact with the outside world since May of this year, Solafa and her husband are barely enduring, and now they face an increased risk of contracting COVID-19. Here's more of Solafa's story. Solafa Magdi was just doing her job as a multimedia journalist based in Cairo and an expert in mobile journalism. Solafa went into the streets every day to talk to her fellow citizens and report on issues important to her viewers. It was not easy in this political climate. Since President Sisi's ascent to power in 2013, attacks on the media and on journalists themselves have soared. Last year saw the first large anti-regime protests since the events of 2011, but the repression continues. Authorities have imprisoned and prosecuted thousands of protesters, and currently there are at least 26 journalists in prison. That number now includes Solafa Magdi, who was unjustly imprisoned in November of 2019 for allegedly publishing false news and belonging to a terrorist group. While the world's attention has been on the global pandemic, U.S. elections, and countless other major stories, Solafa has been languishing in jail because of her reporting. Solafa's passion is journalism. She founded a school to train young women in journalism and mobile reporting. And her interest in human rights extended to reporting on efforts to eradicate poverty and reduce plastic waste. Honored by the United Nations, Solafa had a bright future. Solafa and her husband have been in a limbo of pretrial detention. In August of this year, Solafa and her husband were accused on more trumped-up charges. The daily mistreatment and horrific conditions, all during a global pandemic, continue unabated. With no trial date set for these charges, Solafa must wait. And it really is harsh for those in Egypt, journalists and human rights defenders. On our show tonight, we reported on three more who've been rounded up in Egypt on trumped up charges. It's really important. Egypt is a strong ally of the United States. And it's really important that we keep our light shining on that area right now. And since Salafa cannot be with us, her family has sent us some remarks for me to share with you. So here they are. She says, or they say, Frankly, we had a strong feeling that Solafa would receive this award because we've always believed in her talent and her hard work. We believed in her chances to receive the Courage in Journalism Award because to us, she deserves all the awards in the world for her dedication and her professionalism. Solafa is a relentless worker and has been an example of dedication and sincerity both at work and in her personal life. Solafa is the backbone and support of all her family and friends. She never tires of helping without ever expecting anything in return. We wish she could be with, present to receive this award in person and that we could all celebrate her achievement together. But she's unfortunately unjustly imprisoned, barred her most basic rights as she's not even been able to send a simple letter to her family. We really hope that we can see the end of this nightmare soon and have Solafa and Hossam back to their life and work, but mostly back to their son Khaled, who's been asking for them and wondering why they've been away from him for over a year. The emotional distress this situation is causing him is getting us increasingly worried. We all hope that Solafa and Hossam can be with us in the nearest future and don't see more of their lives wasted being punished for crimes they did not commit. 
That is why it's so important that we recognize these dedicated and fearless people. Here is a video clip of Salafa's son Khalid. Uh, he also wanted to congratulate his mother himself, so here he is. Bittersweet, but we can't imagine a more beautiful tribute to Salafa than the words of her own son. Of course, all our hearts break for her and for the little boy. The IWMF will continue to follow Salafa's situation closely and advocate, of course, for her release. It is journalists like Solafa, Jessica, Gulshera, and Yakin who are shining a light for all of us to follow. They know firsthand what a world without a free press looks like. And now, Elisa, back to you. Thank you, Christian. We are grateful beyond words for your contribution to the journalism profession, your support of the IWMF, and your incredible barrier-breaking work. You also inspire all of us. And to all of our guests today, thank you for your attention and your support. We could not do this important work without each and every one of you. Your help allows the IWMF to provide journalists with, life, with a lifeline in times of crisis. Now more than ever, women journalists around the world face dangers as a result of their reporting. Through our emergency fund, we provide grants for physical and medical care, temporary relocation assistance, legal aid to working women, working under dangerous conditions. Earlier in the program, I drew your attention to our Text to Pledge campaign, and I'd like to remind you of the power of your support. By contributing through the Text to Pledge number on your screen, or through the IWMF's website, iwmf.org, you will directly and immediately assure that journalists, like today's awardees, have the critical support they need for their work and more to survive. We need each and every one of you to make this work possible. We're so grateful that you spent your time with us today, and we hope that you will continue to follow and to support the IWMF by visiting us online and on social media. And thank you, Christian, for hosting this celebration. It was my great honor. And a quick last word, as we mentioned earlier, almost two thirds of women journalists live with threats just for doing their jobs. So many have been silenced, even in the United States. And it is our duty to support them in every way we possibly can. And you can do it right now by contributing to the IWMF. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you for helping to ensure that women receive equity of opportunity in the news media, no matter where they are or what odds they face. And we hope to see you in real, in real life next year. <laughs>